This is episode number 470 with Robin Lieberman, Healing from Emotional Abuse. Hi, everybody. I'm Sandy Weiner. Welcome back to Last First Date Radio, where we believe it is never too late to go on your last first date. And if you want support on your journey to lasting love, I wrote a book just for you. It's called Becoming a Woman of Value, How to Thrive in Life and Love. And it's filled with 30 stories and tips and exercises designed to help you step more fully into your value, which is really, if you're dating, that's where you want to come from. And you can find it now on Amazon for Kindle or paperback. And this week's tip from the book is step number one, which is love yourself first. It just happens to really go well with this week's topic, because um, if you love yourself first, you have less of a chance of falling into these emotionally abusive relationships, if you know yourself, if you know what your standards are, if you know where to set the bottom line and the boundary, you're going to have less of a chance of falling for potential or charm. And we're going to get more into it um, when I bring Robin in. And I will bring her on in just a moment. But before I do, I just want to give a shout out to my Facebook group, Your Last First Date. We are an amazing group of over 3000 women um, who are all interested in growth and learning on the journey to the last first date. And so uh, if you're interested in a group that is unlike most of the groups out there for people who are dating where it's just a cesspool of, of complaints and um, it doesn't really help you to grow into really finding what you want, Come and join us at your last first date. And now for Robin, she is an educator. She's a novelist with life experience in the areas of marriage and divorce, long-term relationships and middle-aged dating, her own triumphs and those of other women who have used her as their sounding board gave her the impetus to write her debut novel, which we're gonna talk about today. And it's called Searching for September. This fictional romance and suspense captures the essence of a woman who is finding passion in what ultimately becomes an emotionally abusive relationship. Robin lives in Manhattan and she loves to travel all around the world and spend time with her intimate circle of friends. She has a daughter and a son and three grand pups. <laughs> Welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Sandy, and thank you for that great introduction, and it is a pleasure to be here with you. Ah, thank you. Well, let's start with telling us a little bit about the book, Searching for September, a little synopsis, and tell us why you were compelled to write it. So, Searching for September, my novel, it tells a story about a divorced middle-aged woman who had always viewed marriage and romance very idealistically. And we call her Seppi in the book, which is short for September. Mm -hmm. And then she enters a culture of midlife dating, which she finds very frustrating, very disappointing. But unexpectedly, she's at a, at a happy hour on a Thursday evening and she meets Teddy, who is a widowed attorney. And he, he sweeps her off her feet and they begin this whirlwind uh, romance. Um, what's interesting is that he is hosting his firm's annual party in their blue room, which is a room in the restaurant. And a very big part of the book is how she yearns to be on his arm and yearns to be escorted into that blue room. And that's a huge focal point for the book. But, you know, in finding this whirlwind, uh, whirlwind romance, she feels like she's finally found her needle in the haystack. Um, he hits it up on all levels. She has a physical connection with him. She has what she thinks is a very strong emotional connection with him. And uh, soon after she falls hopelessly in love and is asked to move into his home, with him and his young daughter. And, you know, as their lives begin to unfold, he becomes very controlling and begins to tear her down and play upon her vulnerabilities. 
but in an effort to remain in a romance where she feels that she has found this great emotional, emotional and physical connection, um, she stays with him and finds ways to justify his actions, hoping that the Teddy that she met in the beginning will return. Um, which is very common in women who are in abusive relationships because they're really blindsided by that and they're hoping that that person will eventually return. So, you know, after being years of being denied access to this event, she does comply with his rationale and if they go each year, he goes to the event, she waits for him in a Manhattan hotel room till he comes back. And one of the big turning you know, points in the story is when his daughter is trying to reach him and nobody could reach him by phone. And now she has to go to the blue room to look for him. Um, everyone's life changes forever. Uh, of course, I, I won't get more into the book because I, I don't wanna ruin it for people who have not read it, but it's, uh, it really is a pretty powerful story. Yeah. And it's a relatable story. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, I, one of my very first episodes of Last First Date Radio, I interviewed a woman who wrote a book about marrying a narcissist, divorcing a narcissist. It actually became such a huge issue. And I remember all the control issues, the fact that he alienated her from her family and her friends. And it's a very typical behavior of people with narcissistic um, disorders. And it's so easy to get sucked in to charming people, especially when you've been dating and people can be boring and they don't have such exciting lives. And here's a person who seems to choose you and you get so taken in. And there are little red flags that come up, but you push them down. So I'd love for you to um, tell our listeners, what are some of the key lessons you'd like them to take away from the story and from being in an emotionally abusive relationship? Um, well, you know, if, if I relate directly to my novel, the one thing about Seppi is that she did have this very idealistic view of what marriage and romance would be like. Um, you know, in, in the book, she remembers being a preteen reading through her mom's pamphlets, the old 1950s, you know, pamphlets on what it's like to be married. And she carried with her those ideals in her head, um, you know, thinking that some magical thing will usher her off, off this platform. And it just, it never, <laughs> it never happens that way. And this day and age is very different than it was in the 1950s. So, she was, she really was looking to try to live out that fantasy, um, you know, so, so that was one thing, um, you know, and then she's blindsided by getting herself involved with a narcissist. One of them, what I think is one of the most important things um, that I think is very relatable for really women of all ages is to appropriately heal from another relationship that hasn't worked out. Um, a lot of times it's, uh, it, it feels better to be tethered to another person, to be part of a couple, because especially in midlife, that seems to be the culture. Um, and there are many reasons why, why women stay, but just in you know finding the person who's right for you, you can't jump from one relationship to the next. You need that time to heal um, and to really absorb what it is that didn't work in that past relationship. What is it that you're looking for? What is it that will make you happy? Um, and, and if you don't do that, then you're just, you're turning the red flags into green flags and you're accepting you know, things in the beginning of a relationship that might not really suit what it is you need. Yeah, those are really important. I think the whole fantasy is so common too, where not just, you know, what you're reading, but what you're watching and what you're 
fed from the time you're a little girl or a little boy, like Disney feeds us this night is going to come and show up and save you. And, you know, there's going to be this amazing partner who's going to rescue you. And if you don't work out your childhood issues, your, you know, your daddy issues, your whatever it is. I mean, I have a client who, who married her sister, you know, a man who was just like her, her abusive sister. Like it's, it's, we tend to repeat patterns until we heal. And so healing and not falling for charm is, is really, really important. And I, I, you know, I think before I did my own internal work, I just would fall for whatever my heart said and not my head. And you've got to balance both. You have to, to have head and heart come along for the ride and not ignore those red flags or turn them into green flags, like you said. Mm. And, and also you said something, you also said something that's, that's very important. You, you do have women who come from very significant family histories of abuse, whether it's parent to parent or parent to child. And it can be very difficult for somebody to recognize that pattern and to try to break that cycle. Um, and then, you know, you have women who feel that they don't deserve to have better than what they've grown up with, you know, they, they don't deserve to have a better relationship, because that's what they're used to. So that that's very, uh, very important point. Yeah, it's actually the first thing I do with a client is we, we review family history, because if you don't, you will not recognize where you're getting stuck. And sometimes, you know, even growing up in a in a family where you thought it was really great, it's not abusive in any way, there still are patterns that create trauma. And we don't always realize that there's trauma. So for example, I moved a lot as a child, moved 10, 12 times, like we were constantly moving. And so constantly getting used to new schools and new people and not and not wanting to attach to people because then I'd have to leave them. That that stays with you and can repeat itself in a romantic relationship. So, you know, I had a mentally ill father and I speak about him a lot on the podcast because that influenced what I chose in partnership, you know, wanted somebody who was self-regulated and, um, you know, and, and responsible for emotions. And a lot of times we don't even see it. I had a client who had a mother who wasn't well. And so she was loving, but because her mother was sick a lot, she had to tamp down her personality and she didn't show up authentically. And so she ended up marrying a very narcissistic man who didn't pay attention to her because she wasn't really her. And so it's taken a lifetime for her to now work through coaching with me. She's discovered, oh, this is why I have this pattern. So the, the, it's like, it's not always so obvious. That's what I'm trying to say. Right. I mean, I, I have that written in my book where, you know, Seppi is flipping through these 1950s pamphlets. And yes, I had done that as a preteen. I remember being at my grandparents' house and flipping through them. And, you know, you have the, you know, the woman pulling the chicken out of the oven and, you know, getting the man his slippers. And so, you know, I, I do get a lot of that from, you know, from my own history. And, and I, I guess in a lot of ways, I, I always thought about it very idealistically as well. And I was married very young. Um, you know, my mom was married at 19 years old. And, you know, I thought, well, you know, most people get married in their in their early 20s. How old were you? I was 23. Mm. I was 23. Which uh, in some cultures is still considered like, exactly the right age and even on the, the older side I mean I grew up in a in a very orthodox Jewish community where 23 was you were supposed to be married by 21 still right. you know even when I, my daughter got married and she she was you know very observant and she was 23 and that they had mm -hmm. been dating for four years which is unheard of in those in those circles right right 
Um, you know, so so in my novel, there are a lot of a lot of red flags, um, and just you know, even in speaking with female friends. I was able to pull the material together from listening to the woes and the struggles of, of, of other women and what they're going through. Um, you know, and I, I think that all of us, like you said, all of us at some time or another have been in situations that have made us uncomfortable, situations that didn't quite match up with what, you know, what we're looking for. Um, there's there is one specific, um, something specific that I do talk about in the novel with Teddy's controlling behavior, which uh, actually had happened to me at one point where I was dating a man who at the very beginning would keep me on the phone for hours, hours and hours at night. Um, I, you know, from nine o'clock at night until two, three o'clock in the morning, uh, just talking about all, you know, at some point it, it didn't even make sense anymore. Uh, and, you know, then you were able to glean that there's obviously something wrong with that relationship and he's trying to get a, you know, a control over you and brainwash you or whatever it is, but to be on the phone for hours, hours and hours with someone is, you know, let's talk about a red flag. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so let's talk about some of the red flags that um, Seppi ignored and just to, just to touch on what you just shared, I very early on in my dating after my divorce, I had a guy who sent me his entire life story in an email. And he was like, you need to know all of this before we meet. And I said, no, I really don't. And he said, no, you really do. And he, he seriously wrote, here's where I was born. Here's my mother, my father. And it was like, I didn't know why it was uncomfortable but I knew that I didn't need to know that. And he, t he was a very controlling person. Mm -hmm. Stories he shared with me were all about being controlling, but he thought they were hero stories. I'm the hero, I did this. And I'm like, yeah, that's really not okay. So at least, you know, I had the wherewithal at that point, but, you know, it's like, we don't always know why something feels weird. Like it can feel amazing to talk for hours. It can feel like you're special to that person and he only wants to talk to you. And so you ignore that red flag, which is like, why is he taking all my time away? Why is he talking so much to me? That's, oh, that is exactly how it felt. What man would want to be on the phone with me for hour after hour after hour every single night? Um, no man had had ever done that. So, and you're you're right. It makes you feel special. It makes you feel like you've really found that right person. Uh, and Sandy, what you just mentioned about somebody sending you their life history, the first thing that comes to my mind is it's a script. It's a script that's being sent to other women as well. Mm. Uh, and, you know, maybe nine out of 10 women might pick up on what you picked up, but he'll have that 10th person that might go for it. Yeah. It's also oversharing any, in any form is a form of a lack of boundaries. You know, it's an unhealthy thing to share so much about your life before you know somebody you're connecting with them and projecting onto them. And those are all massive red flags, but often we don't see that because we don't know how to identify red flags. Let's take a quick break to hear from our sponsors. This episode is brought to you by Amazon Music Unlimited. You can listen to over 70 million songs and thousands of playlists and stations. Plus, you can now stream your favorite podcasts like Last First Date Radio. You can listen to any song, anytime, anywhere, on any of your devices, your smartphone, your tablet, your PC or Mac, Fire TV, and any Alexa-enabled devices like the Amazon Echo. Get Amazon Music Unlimited for free for 30 days. Just head on over to getamazonmusic.com 
forward slash last first date to learn more and claim this offer. So he had a lot of, Teddy had a lot of control, um, but it's subtle, like it can be subtle, like talking on the phone. So what, uh, what other red flags did she ignore or what was willing to overlook or turn into a, a green flag? Well, the one, the one thing at the very beginning of the relationship when he was picking her up for their first date, um, it, it would be natural for her as for any woman to jump in a jump in a cab and meet somebody at the venue. And she was she was telling him on the phone that she would leave her place at about whatever it was, 715, 730 to meet him at the venue. And he makes a comment to her about you should never you should never expect that that a man would not pick you up and take you out. I'll be picking you up and you should, you know, think more of yourself than to, you know, jump in public transportation. Mm. And that really kind of, that really toyed with her. Well, now he feels I don't think enough of myself. And, you know, she, she was really upset by that comment that he made. And then she's beating herself up. I should have thought more of myself. I should have expected that he 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 should pick me up. And that was very, very early on. Then they become they begin dating, and he asks her to move in. And that's the other red flag is when a man moves to a very serious relationship very quickly and doesn't allow that relationship to unfold naturally. And she was just, you know, she was excited to move in with him. There were just, there were so many, so many red flags in there. One, and another one that comes to mind, which I, I think is very significant. Um, I have a Valentine's Day chapter where she's at work and he sends her a box of long stem roses. She never in her life had received a box of roses with this beautiful note. And so she, you know, she's on her way home from work and they don't have plans to go to a restaurant or go out, but she stops at a gourmet bistro to pick up a Valentine's Day dinner for, uh, for her and Teddy and his daughter. And in all of her running around, she must have missed his phone call because he then wanted to go out to dinner. So she arrives at the house and he's in the car, his daughter is in the car and he's saying to her, we're going out to a restaurant, you know, like get in the car and let's go. Why didn't you answer your phone? And she tries to explain to him that she tried to do something nice. She stopped to pick up $150 worth of food. And like now what, it, it will all go to waste. And he said, well, if you want to stay here, you can stay here and you could eat the food. I won't eat leftovers or we can cut it into the meat, into the dog's dish and he can have it later. Yep. And she's so blindsided by him because here, look at this overture by sending her an expensive box of roses. And then she sees him and whatever she tried to do for him, that was nice. He just kicked it to the curb. <laughs> Yeah. Like there were no words for that whole situation. Right. That's, that's what we would probably call gaslighting where she, you know, in many of these situations, she's starting to question herself and maybe there's something wrong with me that I would take public transportation for a date. And maybe why would I question moving in so quickly he obviously loves me and why would i you know buy this food and not throw it out you know it's that's that's how narcissists start to manipulate but it's also it's waiting for that person you first met to return mm -hmm. to be that to be that person again and you know holding out hope that that will happen yeah yeah right and keep thinking it's only a matter of time or if I say the right thing or do the right thing, then he'll come back, maybe. Um, so what are some of the reasons that women stay in relationships like this? Um, so you mentioned, you know, hoping that somebody would come back. But yes, yeah, so can you share some other reasons? You know, absolutely. So if, um, 
sometimes I always say that sometimes the fear of being alone is greater than the fear of being with the wrong person. Um, if uh, there's an importance that's attached to being part of a couple, um, once a relationship ends, the whole social dynamic changes greatly, especially if you're surrounded by other couples. You're just put into a very different social situation. Um, also, it's, um, it's comforting. It's comforting to feel needed and wanted. Um, but again, I, I have to go back to, you know, women being able to identify what it is they're looking for. So if a woman is looking for a relationship that's both, you know, a mono monogamous relationship that's both sexually and emotionally satisfying, um, you know, it, it could be difficult to find that, but it is comforting to feel needed and wanted sexually. And in that moment, during those times, you're feeling close to somebody it's filling a void for you. But if what, it, if what you're looking for is that emotional connection as well, you know, at the end of the day, you're really not getting what you need. You're only getting it in that moment. And um, it's important to have, at the appropriate times, have these kind of conversations and being able to show your authentic self um, that this is what you're looking for. And I believe that sometimes women don't want to show their authentic selves because they want to keep a relationship going where they're hoping, you know, hoping that something is going to change. Um, you know, but but if it's not your guy, it's not your guy. And and that will come out eventually. You just yeah. save yourself a lot of heartache when, you know, when you discuss, when, you know, you talk about the things that you're looking for. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, we tend to excuse the inexcusable and being authentic, having tough conversations early on, even just saying, you know what, this is not working for me, or even getting curious about what a person means by what they say. I mean, I, I had a guy want to drive me home from a date where I met him. Um, and I said, no, I'm not comfortable getting in a car with someone I don't really know. And he said, well, then can I walk you? And I said, okay. It was like a 20 minute walk back from the bar that we were at. And um, there was no touching, there was no kissing, you know, but if a person starts to move too quickly, you have to know what your standards are, what you want, who you are, and speak up in, in a way that doesn't push the other person away, but shows who you are. And if a person gets annoyed, that's a good sign, actually. And so I have had women who where a guy doesn't stop talking and he doesn't ask questions on a first date. So that's a, an example where somebody might think he's really controlling or he's just not empathetic or he's selfish, but you don't know. He might be nervous. <clears throat> and so he won't know how you feel um, uh, unless you speak up. Right. I, I, and I, I want to speak to that as well um, in being able to step out on the ledge and have those difficult conversations. So, for example, and, and I certainly can use myself as an example, um, if, you know, I, I have been in situations where I've met divorced men who, who have not had children. And for me, the red flag for me is when they don't ask any questions about my children. That to me is a telltale sign. And it, it, it is important to have that conversation because, and I'm not saying everybody, but you will find there are men who don't really want to be part of that bigger picture. And, you know, my children, you know, they're grown, but my children are important to me. Um, and I would want that special someone to be, to really be part of my life. And that includes my children. 
Um, but you can find a man who is, you know, in, in their 60s, no children, only interested in travel, not interested in having anything to do with the bigger picture with children or if grandchildren are on the way. Uh, and that, I wouldn't even say, you know, a red flag. That's just something that would not work for me. So it is important to have those conversations. And then the other thing I want to, I also want to back into, you know, what, what you were mentioning before about these, you know, red flags and, you know, going out on dates. There are, there, there are so many of those that can come up right away. And, uh, and I always say that, you know, people will treat you by what you allow as a woman and you you know, you cannot sell yourself short. Um, if I go out on a date, I expect to be with a gentleman. I expect to be treated like a lady. And uh, all too many times, and, and not only for me, but also for other single women who I know, there are a lot of unwanted sexual innuendos before you even met a person, before you've even gone out on that date. Um, you know, a people that'll send a provocative picture before you've even gone out on that date. And that's just, there you go. <laughs> it's, it's over. It's just over at that yeah. point. But you have and, to pay attention to that. Like you can't you, ignore that. Right. And even what you, you know, uh, there are men who have said, oh, can we continue the date back at your place? Uh -huh. Or they'll ask a question, do you like sex? Or I'd imagine from your pictures that you're great in bed. You know what? My guy, my guy will allow that relationship to, to unfold organically. Yeah. And it, and again, I'm going to go back to this. There will be nine out of 10 women who won't go for that, but that man will get that 10th woman who will go for that. Mm -hmm. And look, it's all a matter of what, you, what you're looking for. And um, I, as many women I know, are looking to go out with a gentleman. And I, you know, I, as many other women, won't go for less than that. Yeah, which is important to know your standards and know who you are and know what you want and need. And don't allow the behavior of people who are not what you want and need. I mean, I had a guy once say to me, towards the end of a conversation, we were just having a first phone conversation. And he said, are you okay that I lost an inch? And I'm like, we all lost an inch. Like, I mean, you know, we're at this stage in life, I think everybody lost at least an inch. And he goes, well, it, was, it wasn't from the other place or something. He made a, a really nasty comment. And I was just I, like, no, don't even go there. Don't. And I, you know, it's like, I pick, I pick up on that stuff. That is really, it's not classy. It's not, it's, it's like, what do you want to prove to me? How big your penis is? Like, seriously, I don't need to know that. Um, and so, yeah, we need to know who we are, what we want. And look, there are people who are dating and just want casual sex and that's fine. But if you are looking for a serious relationship and then you allow people like this to pull you in, it's gonna be trouble. So speaking of that, um, I would love to hear your final words of advice for anyone who wants to go on their last first date. You've shared a lot of great information here and a lot of warning signs, but it, if you can share one more piece of advice to, to help people out there who are susceptible, um, please share with us. Yeah. Um, well, I've, I've already talked about you know, giving yourself the wonderful gift of you and being your authentic self and you knowing what it is that you need. Um, I'd, I'd like to mention though something about the online dating and the serial texting and chatting um, because that, that's something else that 
uh, you can get caught up in these men who they just they want to talk on the phone all the time. They want to send texts back and forth. Uh, and I've actually had that experience where after a few conversations and text, oh, can we do a FaceTime? You know, can we do video chatting? And it's no, I want to go out on a traditional date. Like, it's almost like they, they want that guarantee that if they're going to pay for a drink, they know exactly what they're getting. And there are people who are serious texters and, you know, ends up not meeting. So uh, I would say that becomes another, another red flag. And, and just to know that, you know, yeah. ha have all of that, it, you know, in your mind when, when you're looking and you're dating and um, because so many of these dates, they, they never come to fruition. You never end up meeting these people. You know, if, if you exchange a picture, you ex exchange a phone call, make the date make that date. If a person is that interested, they will not let you get off the phone without making a date. Mm -hmm. um, and if you don't do that, you just, you're wasting your time with so many people. Yeah, I totally agree with that. I, um, I made the mistake early on in my dating to talk on the phone and exchange that we didn't text in those days. That's how long ago it was, but right. it was like, email after email and sending me poetry and we were both convinced that this was it and he was a lovely guy but he lived about an hour away and so we just kept talking on the phone but we were already projecting a relationship before we even met and that was such an important experience for me because when we finally met it was so disastrous and there was zero attraction I was repulsed by him and I was like wow um you know, it's like you, you need to know what is the energy that's going to be exchanged between two people who meet in person and then take it from there. But people love to just get stuck in these text and chat and not set a date. And either we're, we're on the same page, we both want to meet or we don't. And yeah, I think that's very wise advice. And I think, you know, all of this is really about taking back your power and not giving giving it up for somebody who who doesn't deserve it like you they haven't earned the right to all of this time and all of your heart and all of your soul and your money which also happens with people who are very susceptible so don't fall for potential don't fall for like this idea of who he is which is what happens when we text and talk too much we just build this fake person. That is so true. Yeah, that is that is so true. And and you know, for, for the men that come off, like you say, being very inappropriate, and believe me, I've, I've had a lot of those comments directed my way. Um, sometimes I turn it on them and say, Look, you know, you you have a daughter who's in her 20s. How would you feel if a man treated your daughter like that? And uh, thing to say. Yeah. yeah, and you know what, you just you're not my fit. I wish yeah. you well. And exactly. cut it at that point and block them and you're done. Yeah. And I love the way you said that because a lot of people think it's harsh and it's mean to cut somebody off, but you said it kindly and you're saying, I wish you well, but you're not, you're not my guy. I'm looking for something else. That's it. End of exactly. story, period. Don't talk anymore. <laughs> <laughs> So on that note, Robin, thank you for coming on the show and tell, tell our audience how they can read your book, find your book and find you. Okay, so my uh, book is Searching for September and it is available on Amazon. You can get it in Kindle, uh, in paperback, in hardcover. And uh, it will lead, if, if you go on to the Amazon, it will also lead you to my Facebook page, which is um, Robin A. Lieberman. Okay. So that's the best way to and this connect is with you. The book. There's the book. Beautiful. Yes. Well, congratulations on publishing your story and I'm sure that people all over from all walks of life can relate to this. It's uh, Unfortunately, it's a common, it's a common tale, 
And I think people need this cautionary information to stay safe and find a real person, not a fake idealized relationship. I'm also nine chapters into the sequel, ah. which will come out next year. Awesome. I'm very excited about that. And thank you so much for having me uh, on your podcast and for the interview. Very important topic. Um, thanks everybody for listening. If you love our show, please rate and review us. Subscribe to the show wherever you listen to podcasts. It really means the world to the su continued success of our show. And we hope you go on your last first date very soon.